Our speaker today is Christina Larkin, and she's talking about, is anything actually working in public education? Let's all welcome our speaker. Hello, everyone. My name is Christina Larkin. Like many of you, I have many hats. But today, some of the ones I'm wearing are that I'm a trustee with Lethbridge Public School Division. I am the director of community programs at the YMCA of Lethbridge. I'm an auntie to many wonderful littles who I care very deeply about. And I'm a lifelong educator, youth worker, and community advocate. When SACWA was looking for some more topics, Certainly, public education is always something I want to talk about. And then I thought, I need to write a SACPA question for the title. <laughs> and often, these conversations, which I love dearly, I haven't been to SACPA in many years, but I used to come a lot, and it is always fabulous. Often, these questions are very critical. What are the things that are wrong right now that we need to fix? What's happening in our world that we don't love? These are questions I grapple with all the time. I'm also a very critical person, <laughs> always trying to think about how do we make our lives better, how do we make this world a better place. But frankly, I sometimes get tired of just the constant criticism of public institutions. Hearing some agreement. <laughs> because the truth is, things are awesome, actually. There is a lot going very, very well. There's a lot of room for improvement. We're under no pretenses that things like education are exactly what all of us want every moment of the day. But a lot of things are working really well because people are working really hard to make it so. We are learning from evidence and creating public institutions like public education that are creating incredible learning outcomes for thousands of students in this city and beyond. So today, I'm really pleased to be able to share with you some of the things that I think are working really well in our public institution of public education. My friends would, and my family know that I'm uh, honestly dangerously optimistic, so that's the, the theme of today. <laughs> um, I want to start by saying that the challenges are real. If you know me from the protests and the events, you know that I am no stranger to knowing what is wrong every day in the world of education, of youth, of families, of children, and that I, like you, work very hard to try to make things better. Things like underfunded students. We have hundreds of students in divisions across the, uh, the province that are not funded at all. We don't have a single dollar allocated to them from the provincial government to their classroom care. We have overwhelmed staff, crowded classrooms across Alberta, insufficient learning supports, in particular for, for students with exceptional uh, learning disabilities. We have overwhelmed community support resources and eroding trust in public institutions. I'm certain that these topics have been well covered at SACPA and will be in the future. Today I'm gonna focus on the successes because they are also real. I truly believe that in order to create strong public institutions and healthy communities, we need to create, maintain, and feed our visions of what our schools are, what our schools can be. I was at a conference recently about healthy schools, and someone posed the question, what would it feel like to know that every student walked into your school, and as soon as they crossed the threshold, took a deep breath and said, wow, I'm so glad I'm finally back. It honestly brings me to tears, thinking that that is a possible thing. For many students, that is actually what they experience. We have so many students for whom school is a refuge. School is a place where they are seen, where they are learning things that they are interested in. They are feeling successful. They are successful. They are being springboarded to the next phase of their life with the support of a community behind them. So what's working for those students, and how do we know? If I assume many of you are teachers. <laughs> um, 
as you know, education loves assessment. We love evaluating things. We want to know not just what you did, but how you did it. You got to show your work. So we do a ton of assessment on the institution of public education, not just about things like graduation rates, which are certainly a valuable indicator. We do student surveys. We have assurance results. We have student forums, parent forums. We have a town hall coming up tomorrow, uh, February 6th. We have community engagement surveys. We have a variety of board committees and administrative committees that get the work done day to day, making sure our schools are doing what they can. A lot of the things I'm talking about today are pulled from that. It's not just what I think. <laughs> it's pulled from, in particular, student surveys, which can all be found on our, the Lethbridge School Division's public measures dashboard. Uh, sorry, the performance dashboard, which is a publicly available, ongoing, active dashboard on the website where you can see all of the results, all the demographics, all of the outcomes of learning, graduation rates, re student registration, live in real time, including our financials. I also really focused on our student forum. Last year, I had the opportunity to participate with dozens of students across the division in a full day of talking about what's working for them and what's not. The themes that they identified in their student forum about what do you enjoy about school included things like time with friends, the food, access to technology in the classroom, cultural diversity, freedom of expression, and the options in extracurriculars. So I want to start with that first, that last one, the options in the extracurriculars. Something I think is going really well in schools is inquiry, options, flexibility, and co-curriculars. Children, offering children and youth learning opportunities that work for their unique interests and the needs of students today, as well as the futures that we frankly cannot even imagine, these things are critical for learning. There are numerous studies that indicate that balancing a foundation of instruction, so teacher-led instruction, with student-led learning, inquiry-based learning, finding that sweet spot of having teacher instruction in every class and having a balance of inquiry-based learning in every class or most classes leads to 26% improvement in educational outcomes. So we know that teaching and learning is enhanced by a foundation of both instruction and the opportunities for self-guided learning. And from the student surveys, we know that this is also important to students. What a sweet balance. Love when we can balance what kids actually like with the evidence. So some of the things that we offer that create flexible learning opportunities for students that many of us may not be aware of if we've never participated in it are things like dual credit. The Lethbridge School Division works hard with post-secondary institutions for students to be able to take courses that give them credit for high school and for post-secondary. Can you imagine entering a post-secondary and you already have credits? Think about it. You could take one less class every semester, be more successful on the journey through your post-secondary, and have had a better shot of picking the right stream the first time. We also have things like off-campus education. We have work experience, the registered apprenticeship program, and the green certificate that gets students certificated in things like trades as well as agricultural work. We also have a super exciting opportunity coming up as a partnership between Holy Spirit, Horizon, Livingston Range, Palliser, Westwood, and Lethbridge School Division. So, a huge amount of school divisions working together for the Southern Alberta Collegiate Institute that's going to be housed at Lethbridge College, banked as the banker board is Palliser. Um, currently, we are already offering pilot projects that are, include four different trades courses that are already full. We are so excited to be able to offer students pathways through, post, through secondary school that allow them to actually graduate, to be successful, to be excited to come to high school. For some of us who are keeners, easy to do. I was always excited about school. <laughs> there are students for whom walking into high school every day sounds dreadful. We need to find opportunities for them to make it all the way through and achieve a high school diploma to open up the doors that they might need in the future. Programs like this are doing that now. We also have programs like Fast Forward. Fast Forward is one of my 
what I think is maybe the best known se or the best kept secret in Southern Alberta. Fast Forward is a program that allows students who are 19 and 20 years old to continue working on their high school credits toward graduation. Last year, we had 113 students in this program, students who otherwise, while they have a right to education under the Education Act, really have a hard time fitting into a mainstream high school. It's very challenging to have a 20-year-old in a high school. <laughs> they would have otherwise maybe just said, well, I guess that's it for me. Education was not for me, I guess that's it. Can you imagine entering as a young person the rest of your adult life thinking that you could barely complete high school, even if you wanted to? That program saw 50 high school graduations last year. Congratulations to those students. Overall, in the last five years, high school graduation rates in the Lethbridge School Division have increased from 76.4% over five years to 86.4%. We have seen an increase, a dramatic increase, in high school graduation rates in only five years in, this, in Lethbridge School Division. To me, this is a sign of incredible success, something that shouldn't be under, undermined. Graduation is not the be all and end all. I worked for a long time with refugee students, for whom many of them, graduation is an unlikely scenario. We really needed to find pathways around high school because there was just no way for them to complete 12 years of Canadian schooling in the two years they had left. But for many students, high school graduation is not an unachievable dream. And programs like Fast Forward, RAP, Dual Credit allow that to happen. We also have incredible innovation happening in our division. We have an uh, award that I've been on the committee for called the uh, Innovation, Creativity, and Entrepreneurship Award, the ICE Scholarship, that provides a $1,000 scholarship to students in grade 9 to 12 for their innovation ideas, innovative ideas. Last year, we had some amazing winners and contenders. We had someone win for things like a Bollywood dance group, creating an earth club, the honestly most bizarre and amazing and interesting digital art project I've ever seen called Escapism that took you down the rabbit holes of the internet that I've never even understood. I still don't really understand that art piece and it was the most thought provoking thing. A drumming program to teach young people how to drum. A music and uh, speech with seniors program to young students in high school who said, I have a talent and I'd love to share it and started reaching out to seniors people who started their own business, like a watercolor business or a baking business. We have incredible students who are doing incredible things, and I think that in part that we have to take at least a little bit of credit for creating strong public institutions where those students can thrive. Another factor I believe to be an important part of public institutions that are successful is our commitment to well-being. At Lethbridge School Division, well-being is now one of our values. I'm so pleased to see it listed as a specific value because it means we can actually resource it. When we put something in a plan, it means we, can, we actually really believe it and we want to make it happen. We know that, that well-being is a foundation of learning. Healthy and well students are ready to learn and healthy and well staff are ready to teach. In 2023, 81% of students described having a positive relationship at school based on the provincial student surveys. 81% of students said that they have a positive relationship at school. I'm not sure that 81% of adults have a positive relationship at work, so <laughs> I think something is going well. <laughs> Again, we know the challenges. 81% is not 100%. 100% of students deserve a positive relationship at school, but for 81%, we've gotten there. Now we work on the rest. We can't talk about well-being in schools and success in public, in, in public education without talking about the caring adults. <coughs> Another one of those ones that brings tears to my eyes. The Search Institute says that young people who have at least one adult, sorry. The Search Institute says that young people who say that they have at least one adult who cares about them have dramatically improved education 
outcomes, lifetime outcomes in employment, well-being, safety, live longer lives, are generally healthier. And these aren't random attributes. Having a person that cares about you when you are young is essential. And it makes a difference in their lives. This is in addition to their parents. Family love and family care and the care of the parents in our division is incredible. The involvement of parents in their educational outcomes of their children is indescribably important. And at the same time, we know that young people must have a community outside their home. No matter what is happening at home, positive or negative, they need an adult that is not their family that cares about them. As a youth worker who has now been living and working in Lethbridge for a shocking 17 years now, I had to do the math the other day, <laughs> I can tell you that is not true for all students. But I can tell you that it is true for many. Our schools are full of caring adults who bend over backward to make sure students feel welcome, cared for, seen, known, loved every single day they walk through the door. They know the students' names. They know what their interests are. They know what they probably did after school and ask them about it. They open up their classrooms to have lunch together. They sit quietly beside them when they're sad. We have caring adults in our schools who make every difference in the lives of young people. And finally, not unrelated to both choice and to well-being, the final thing I think is going really, really well in public institutions, in public education, is belonging. I believe that education organizations across the country are working very hard to create policies, programs, curriculum alignment, and partnerships that enhance the potential that might allow that every student knows they belong in a school. Our division has a variety of policies and procedures, opportunities for feedback, programs that are partnerships with different organizations, and dedicated educators who ensure that their curriculum is aligned with the most, the most evidence-based and child interest-centered programming. A sense of belonging is, is an essential part of learning. There is a mountain of evidence that shows this, but I think if we all look in our hearts, we know that about ourselves. If we show up to something and we feel like we don't belong there, it's pretty hard to learn. When students show up and they know they're an important part, an essential part of making us who we are as a school, they're ready to learn. At the student forum, one of the things that st a student identified about what they enjoyed about school was a sense of connection. They said, you know, everyone is just connected somehow, and it's pretty cool that I'm in there too. Imagining the well-being, the openness, and the calm that comes over a student when they know they belong ensures that when they sit down at their desk, show up for, a new program, go to a new learning opportunity, or pursue their own inquiry, they do it with the security of, of knowing that they are welcomed and supported by their school community. Some of the partnerships that we've made or programs that we've offered that promote a sense of belonging include things like a Think Outside. It's a partnership between Helen Schuler Nature Center our, and our Lethbridge School Division Indigenous Education team, which has three lead teachers, one for each grade or one for each uh, division level, and a coordinator, and they provide land-based education for all grade six and seven students to promote Indigenous learning, land-based education, and frankly, to just get outside. I think we can all remember a school day when we were just itching to get outside, and if we can imagine how much nicer it would be if you got to get outside. Having land-based learning opportunities promotes 
strong indigenous knowledge, not just for indigenous students, but for every student. Things like the partnership between the University of Lethbridge and Red Crow College and the Nitsitapi Teacher Education Program have promoted an increase in qualified teachers from the Blackfoot community that have now been hired at Lethbridge School Division and divisions around our area that infuse this learning into the day to day. We know that these things are not a one and done. We can't have one club assembly and call it a day. Things like Think Outside, our Indigenous learning team, and these type of initiatives in our community allow for the infusion of the beliefs, practices, and values that make our schools places of belonging for all of our students. So, I would ask you, is anything working in public education? Yes, of course it is. It's very easy for us to think of all the things we'd like to fix. And I certainly don't discourage you from doing so. I certainly will be. But I also want to make you think about the things that you think are working. Because it's not just about fixing things that are broken. It's about encouraging, resourcing, and supporting the things that are. The things that are like choice in our schools, having opportunities to learn based on the things we're interested in, having some flexibility in the, our learning style, feeling well at school, having access to a breakfast program that makes sure our bellies are full so we can actually participate in learning on the first class, and feeling like we belong. Every student in our division is an essential part of our school division. We would not be the same without any of them, and we want them to feel like that. So, if it's true that things are working in public education, then what's next? We need to continue to assess what is working and why. We can't just pick things randomly and hope they work. We know that that's not how we teach, so that's not how we build public institutions. We need to use the evidence, we need to listen to students, and make sure that we're visioning together and growing a public education system that continues to work for them and continues to improve. And frankly, we've got to keep working hard. <laughs> this is hard work, being in community with each other. It's hard to listen, and it's hard to incorporate all that information into a system that works for everybody. We have thousands of students in our division, and there are thousands of families, hundreds of staff. How do we get there? We work hard. We keep showing up for each other. The offering of public institution is not a perfect offering that doesn't discount its value. It doesn't discount it to me, and I hope it doesn't discount it to you. I hope that you keep participating in the conversation that builds a public institution like public education. Share the stories of the things that you think are working so we can continue to feed that part. I love public education, and I believe every student in Alberta deserves an education that is complete and reflects them. I believe that that's where we're going, and that's what's happening in classrooms today. Thank you for coming to listen and for valuing public education. Well, thank you very much, Christina Larkin. You've certainly pulled on our heartstrings and uh, let us know that in spite of uh, economic problems in our public school system, the real value in our system is us, is the teachers, is the volunteers, is the public that um, helps with things like the Helen Schuler Center and uh, the indigenous programs. So let's all remember that empathy are, is the real thing that ties the fabric of our community together. Thank you very much <clears throat> to the LSCO, who has generously provided this lovely room free of charge. And thank you for patronizing their lunch counter outside here. Thank you to the University of Lethbridge for their ongoing support. Thanks to Rogers TV for recording our sessions. You can watch Sakpa on Rogers or on sakpa.ca on our ar archives or on our YouTube. Next week, for your pleasure, we are bringing Amanda Bigford. She's speaking on science up first. 
what is misinformation in the digital age? A very provocative topic now that we see what AI can do to our truth. Okay, let's invite our speaker back for your questions. I will ask that you line up along here with your questions. I ask for no long preludes, please. Uh, have, a, have a succinct question. And also, please ensure that you state your name at the onset. So let's welcome Christina back. Thank you. My name is uh, Knut Peterson. Thank you very much, Christina, for coming. I've known you a long time, and uh, you've always been on the forefront of activities that uh, matters to the community. Uh, my, my question is, the first question, I will come back later if there's time, but you have, uh, Lethbridge School Division has a unique working relationship with the Holy Spirit uh, School Division, I believe. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about how you collaborate uh, on things that matters in that bit? Thank you, yes. Yeah, and I would say Lethbridge School Division has partnerships with many school divisions um, in order to improve education across the province. We're really committed to making sure that students have an opportunity to learn in an equitable, equitable way, not just in our division, but across the province. We're actively part of things like um, the Alberta School Board Association, as well as a variety of other committees um, that get us all together. For Holy Spirit, so they, they have many other schools here in Lethbridge. They also have schools outside of Lethbridge, which, which makes it a unique partnership because they also have partnerships with, thing, with divisions like Palliser, who have divisions in their areas. Um, a big thing that we have a partnership with is certainly transportation. So a number of years ago, Lethbridge School Division uh, was using transportation provided at cost by City of Lethbridge. And then we, when that uh, contract ended with the city and was not renewed, we moved to uh, private busing and we now share that expense with Holy Spirit um, to ensure that we have enough bus drivers, enough buses, and uh, can prioritize the effective use of resources. As we know, education systems continue, do continue to be underfunded, in particular in things like services, including transportation. Um, and so being able to partner allows both divisions to be more effective with our resources um, and ensure that kids get to school on time as best we can. <laughs> So my name is Mark Gettle. I'm just wondering. Close, close. Yeah, yeah, closer to the mic. Okay. <laughs> uh, other than financial, what critical factor do you think is lacking that would make things much better? <laughs> just one. <laughs> okay. So other than financial, what is a factor that is lacking, uh, presumably for educational success? A lot of them are tied to financial, but <laughs> um, I would say cross-ministerial collaboration at a provincial level. Families are not isolated units, right? Kids are not just school attendees. They also participate in recreation. They access, their families access employment services. They have disabilities. Their families access childcare. There's a lot of encouragement for schools, school divisions, and school boards to collaborate, and sometimes we don't see that from the folks that are asking us to do that. <laughs> when, we, when schools have to spend the time closing the gap between family services, that takes away from learning. I am a huge advocate for partnerships. I'm a community service delivery person myself. Um, we deliver services with Lethbridge School Division. Um, I offer childcare, we, I have many services. The amount of manual labor it takes to close the gap is daily work. If the services themselves were not so far apart, <laughs> that work would be less and that would allow schools to do their part of the job, which is educate children. 
I believe that schools are community hubs. And I also believe it to be true that they're being over relied upon to deliver community services. There are experts in things like disability services, experts in things like childcare, experts in things like family support. Teachers are experts at teaching. And now we expect them to also be social workers, healthcare aides, disability support workers, lawyers. <laughs> um, they can't do it all, and we're setting them up for failure. So um, something that talking doesn't cost much, right? But it's costing schools a lot. Thank you, Christina. Um, uh, it's good to hear positive things that are happening, and it's always nice to, yeah, it's always nice to be able to r recognize those things. Uh, of course, you you sparked my interest in several different things, so I have to pick which ones I'm going to talk, ask you to respond more to. Um, can you say more about off-campus experiences yeah, and what those options are for, for students? Because I love that kind of stuff. Yeah, you bet. So uh, off-campus education, we have an off-campus education coordinator, Andrew Kroll, at the Lethbridge School Division, who is, I swear to God, a magician. He, um, he coordinates things like work experience, so individuals or classes can access employers and go get credits, getting job experience, getting hands-on learning opportunities, and again, a chance to get out of the school. <laughs> which is sometimes the attracting feature for students. Um, we have things like the uh, registered, uh, sorry, registered Apprenticeship Program, RAP. Um, I'm from Fort Murray originally, and when I was growing up, RAP was huge. The amount of, obviously, the, the pathway for success for many people in Fort Murray is into trades. It is the same here in Southern Alberta as well, I found. RAP is a fabulous program that allows students in high school to start getting the experience, training, and certifications needed to become a journeyman before they graduate. You could, be, you could be allowed to work in a trade fully independently by the time you're 19. You're well on your way. And you also get high school credit, so um, things like that. We have the green certificate, which allows um, certification in things like um, agriculture, dairy, environmental services. Um, so again, giving them opportunities to ha get their hands dirty in a variety of fields. Um, yeah, so we have, those are some great ones, yeah. <laughs> Hi, Barb Phillips. Uh, thank you, Christina. I think you were proof positive that how you vote matters. So it, this is a little bit Debbie Downer, but I'm, I am really concerned about our next municipal elections when we get to reelect school board trustees. Um, because there's been rumors, not more, maybe more than rumors, going around that uh, there are certain factions in Lethbridge that would like a lot more say in our public health, uh, our public school system. And frankly, as a former teacher, that really bothers me. And as a grandma, it really, really bothers me. So I'd kind of like your take on it because elections matter. And I think I'll be the first to say that, you know, when I get down on my ballot sheet to the trustees portion, that I maybe haven't paid enough attention. Uh, but I'm glad I voted for you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, okay, are we good? I just wanna break it. Thanks, okay. Yeah, so I mean, I'm gonna touch on the last point in particular. Mo most people don't vote for their trustees and it is shocking because you get to vote for trustees at every municipal election. So when you vote for mayor or you vote for your counselors, you can also vote for trustees. Um, and whether or not you have children in the school division, have children at all, I don't have kids, um, but I'm still very engaged in the system because it matters to me what my community looks and feels like and how they're educated. Democracy works if we do, right? If we're getting out there, talking to each other and building this vision of education, voting is one of the ways you can have that voice heard, right? 
and certainly we, there'll be a municipal election coming up in the next 18 months. But it's not the only way, right? And kids grow a lot in four years. <laughs> so we need to make sure to be paying attention to the democratic process and how we get involved in public institutions like education all the way through those to that time. I'm trying to think of the rest of your question there. Um, oh, just about the, the different voices that want to be heard. So certainly elected boards, like the Board of Trustees of School Divisions, should represent our community. And I always want to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to have someone who represents them on their board. There are some people who don't feel well represented by me. I'm glad that you do. <laughs> and it's really incumbent on each of us to figure out what we each want in public education and vote for that one person, right? Or those people that, that represent them. I truly do value all the voices that want to participate in education because I'm a really big believer in consensus. Um, so the decision making of the group <laughs> and trying to find something that's not a compromise and doesn't even necessarily value votes as a one-to-one. -one. There are some issues that matter more to some people because they're more impacted by them, right? And when we vote, it's a one-to-one, -one, but then when we get to the table and we do the work all day, every day for the next four years, it matters that we continue to speak up continue to represent ourselves and others, and participate fully in both the election and all the messy democratic work in the middle. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Ian Hurdle. Uh, I've been a consumer of the system with five children that went through it, and uh, parents and grandparents that did it. My concern is the removal of public from the public education headline. And I think my parents and grandparents would be rolling over in their graves about that because I know they worked really hard to start the system. We can't hear you. I'll repeat it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'll repeat the question. Uh, so the question was about a concern about the removal of the word public from the title of the division, right? So. Um, it used to be included in the title of the division and now it's Lethbridge School Division. Um, I would agree, frankly. Um, we are public education advocates. Our board in particular is a strong, are strong advocates for public education. So education that represents every single student, right? Um, I recently had a good conversation by email with someone who's here about the, the term public um, and how do we build a public institution that actually represents without diminishing the individual values of families, of individual students, and allows space for that complexity because our communities are public and should have space for all of us, and so our public institutions should too. So I would agree, the, the, having the word public removed um, continues to be a sadness, I think. Um, and is something that I agree should not be overlooked as a small change. Um, I think many of us has, have felt an erosion of the public trust <laughs> um, over many years in public institutions from health to education to post-secondary. Um, and I think it's small changes like that where we remove the word public and people maybe don't feel like it's theirs anymore, right? These are nominal, nominal changes, but they make a difference um, in how we perceive ourselves and the system. So I share that sadness. I don't have much uh, useful things to say about it, but I agree. <laughs> uh, Christina, my name is Terry Shellington, and thank you very much for your presentation. Um, kiss the mic. Um, I, I'm interested in hearing a reaction from you to the announcements that Danielle Smith made uh, yesterday that took me by surprise. We have a grandson in Wilson, uh, but do you see, we're go, we're, our province is going to have a major discussion about some of these issues around gender and um, how... We can't hear you. I can't hear you back. There. Okay, I have the impression I was yelling into the mic. Yeah, yell into it. Okay. 
<laughs> anyway, Daniel Smith's announcements of yesterday, I'm curious how you react to it as a trustee. I hadn't seen these issues as burning issues in the lives of uh, um, our grandson, certainly. Uh, is this an important issue, and have you picked, uh, with your finger on the pulse, do you sense this is a, uh, uh, how, do you, how do you view the, the uh, discussion we're launching into? Yeah, I'll talk about I can talk about it. So the question was about the uh, policy proposal announced by Daniel Smith uh, yesterday on social media, and the fuller policies will come out today, um, this afternoon, I believe. And uh, so we'll be, certainly as a division, watching to see what those policies actually are. Um, a seven minute long video on Instagram um, was not as informative for a board of trustees as we would like. Please <laughs> mention what the issue is. Uh, the issue uh, of the, pol the policies um, is related to transgender youth, particularly in schools, um, but also in medical care, as well as in recreation and sport. Um, so as a division, we are waiting to see what they are, what the policy actually says, and how it will impact the division um, and our students. And we reaffirm that we are a caring division where students must feel, and we have a responsibility to ensure that they feel safe, that every student feels safe in our school, that families, staff, and students all belong in our division, and we continue to work on being safe and caring for every one of them. Um, in terms of, um, I don't know where Terry went, oh, over there. Uh, in terms of is this um, an important issue, I would say yes, right? Um, sorry, I even prepared. I was like, I need to talk about this when I get here. <laughs> so, um, it's an important issue to many for a variety of different reasons. For some of us, it's important because we are the people that they are legislating. Um, for many people, it's important because their children are important to them, because their students are important to them. It's an issue that has come up in our division a number of times over the years. Um, we'll all remember many public meetings. The public meeting that we had about six, seven years ago was a huge impetus for me to run as trustee. It was, a, it was a very challenging experience for me personally, and it was a big part of why I ran. Um, our division, I feel like, has invested resources to address the issue, uh, speak with parents, uh, speak with students, speak with staff, try to build a system that works for everyone, um, and it's something that we'll continue to do. Um, in terms of whether it's an important issue, on a very personal level, <laughs> I would rather work on literally anything else. <laughs> there is so many pressing issues in education, and the individual health care of my students is not my job as a trustee. It is the medical system that has many practices that protect them, educational practice that has many practices to protect them, um, child and family services that has many practices to protect all students and families. We need to work on things like numeracy, literacy, get those levels back up. We need to work on indigenous education. We need to, there's so many things we need to work on in this system. It's an important issue and there are so many others that need the airtime. Thank you, Ken Sears. Um, this is some embarrassment, but I, sitting listening to you and I'm realizing I don't really understand the playing field here. I don't understand where Lethbridge School Division's authority um, begins and ends, where Pallisers does, where Holy Spirit does, and where all of the, um, what I'm assuming are a ragtag of independent schools, sectarian schools that are if not in Lethbridge proper, at least around Lethbridge. I would just like a, a, some sort of map to this playing field so I know who's where and who's supposed to be taking care of what. That's a great question. So 
Uh, Lethbridge School Division has 26 schools inside of Lethbridge City Limits. We also have within Lethbridge City Limits um, Holy Spirit Division, who also has schools outside of Lethbridge. Uh, we also have Franco Sud, which is the Francophone School Division, who have a school here um, on 6th Ave. Many people drive by it all the time. Um, those are the three major school divisions that we have in our, in our city limits. Um, Palliser uh, has, is, is a large division nearby that has schools both in, like they have schools in Calgary, they have schools outside of here, They're, they have many schools. Um, and Holy Spirit has many rural schools uh, that are Christian, uh, the you know, separate school system um, extending beyond Lethbridge as well. Um, it's actually a good question. I actually don't know how school limits are set actually, so that's a great question. <laughs> um, presumably there's some jurisdiction that we receive from the provincial government about where we have schools. Um, school divisions do have the opportunity to add new schools. Um, so for example, we have a policy about adding um, alternative programs. Um, schools can be added to our division, things like this, but um, they would all be governed by policies as well as the Education Act. I'm not sure if that helped, but. <laughs> I don't know if you're going to like my question. My name's Mary Tedder, and I'm a retired teacher. And what do you, do you think the, Fed, the provincial government should be funding private and charter schools? Because right now, our tax dollars are, a, a good portion of them are going to fund private and charter schools. And under the, the Education Act in uh, the province, Right from the beginning of the province, there were two divisions. There were the Catholics and the Protestants. And the first division to actually go to community and set up the educational system were the public system. So if you go to St. Albert, the public system is actually Roman Catholic. If you go to Calgary or Edmonton, the uh, pro public system is the one that's public and the separate is the Roman Catholic. But once uh, Ralph Klein came in, they started setting up private and charter schools that weren't funded under the private, the public, and the separate board. And as a taxpayer, I really resent having my money going to someplace like the Weather, uh, Weber Academy and um, Strathcona that are trying to create elite schools. What is your question? My question is, what do, what do you feel about that? Uh, so Lethbridge School Division is part of two sort of umbrella organizations that advocate for education. One is Alberta School Boards Association, which includes um, public, francophone, Catholic schools. And we're also part of Public School Boards Association of Alberta, which advocates for specifically public education. Our board does really believe in public education for all students. We believe that there is an ability to offer the choice that families are looking for within a public system that is accountable to public dollars, that is governed by public institutions like our board. Um, we have a great examples of that in our division. We have Christian schools in our division that then offer the community the option of education that is more focused on their, their home values, but also retains the accountability of that. Right? We, we strongly believe that education should be for everyone, and we believe in the public education system. Um, I know that's not like a, a super clear answer, but as a board, we believe in public education. <laughs> Gail McMartin, I was just curious, given the Premier's announcements about uh, what teachers need to do and what students need to do, as of this morning, the Human Rights Commission has spoken out, the C Canadian Civil Liberties Association has spoken out, saying this is not legal. What role does a school board have in terms of making a decision? What do you advise your s teaching staffs to do? Are you legal? 
or how are you ensuring that you are going to be legal in whatever direction you give to teachers? So as of now, the policies that we're talking about are proposed policies. They do not change any legislation that we have right now. School today was the same as school yesterday. Um, as a board, we await the legal information from both the province and legal experts in our field. Um, as an organization, we always must have policies that are legally allowable. We saw, we see this through many, every time education policy changes, we have to update policies on our end. Um, and as a public institution, we will do that. We will update our policies to the required Education Act um, and any related policies or you know, ministerial um, guidance. And as of today, none of those have changed. So um, like I said, school today, same as school yesterday. So the guidance to all of our um, participants in our system right now is continue following the policies that we have in place, which encourage the safety of all of the students that walk in their room. Um, we have uh, policies on file right now about sexual orientation, gender identity, and how to support um, students, families, staff um, in evidence-based ways that are aligned with the legal obligations of a school division, um, and those continue to be active. The prerogative of the chair is to ask a question. And so I'd like to ask a question that goes across, across two of your hats, trustee and YMCA. So I'd like to know if uh, students <clears throat> at the high schools get to take swimming lessons or swimming at the YMCA for free um, because I'm from California where part of graduation requirements was you had to be able to drive a car and have a driver's license and you had to be able to swim, as both those things caused so many deaths, highways, or in the ocean. So, over to you. So I'll tell you now that high schoolers do not all have high school, uh, do not all have driver's licenses. There is like a shocking decrease in teenagers having <laughs> driver's licenses, as many of you who are shuttling your teenagers around will know. <laughs> Um, and no, uh, so, so wearing both hats, no, we don't have a, a, a swimming program um, as part of a high school curriculum. It's not a mandatory part of physical education curriculum at this time. The physical education and wellness curriculum um, is changing from the provincial government, so we'll wait to see as those changes get integrated. It, the new one also does not include swimming. Calgary YMCA has a free swimming class for grade six um, through the Calgary Flames Foundation, so it's certainly something um, that is possible between schools and YMCAs, but it's not something we have here, unfortunately. Hi, I'm Mary Shillington again. Uh, uh, Christina, you were very positive in, it, in everything you shared, but nothing came up about bullying. And so uh, having um, six uh, great-grandchildren, well, one grandchild and five great-grands going into the school system, um, and one of them has a disability, so I, I, I'm concerned about bullying, and, and, and I know from the work I did as a counselor that bullies are often insecure and not feeling like they're belonging. So what would you say about bullying, and what would you recommend be done in the school division around bullying? Uh, so for bullying, yeah, I didn't bring it up because certainly not the most positive part <laughs> of school. Hasn't ever been, um, still currently is not. Um, certainly there are many students who continue to face um, bullying or harassment, assault, challenges at school um, that make learning very hard to impossible, right? Um, there are many efforts going on to improve the situation of bullying. So um, things like integration of social-emotional curriculum um, as part of the health curriculum, um, 
things like, you know, friendship clubs happening at schools, uh, um, buddy benches, very popular on Facebook. <laughs> Little benches where if you sit down, it means you want to have someone come hang out with you. And so you can sit on this and a friend will come hang out with you. Um, where we see lots of great student leaders stepping up to offer peer support. Um, We have, you know, things like policies in place that it, um, that offer hard limits um, to help educators better understand how to support students, um, how to support families. We have great parent advocates that help us understand their students' needs, and we have great student advocates who, you know, at things like the student forum that I mentioned, um, brought up the hardships that they have interpersonally at school, uh, whether it be bullying or just you know high degrees of conflict, things like that. Um, so we're seeing improvements in things like student voice, um, you know, students being self-advocates, teachers knowing what students want and need from them at that moment. Um, I heard a great quote the other day at a, or a great sort of reminder at a, a Healthy Schools conference the other day about a big part of anti-bullying is just seeing that someone tried to stop it. Right, that really improves the person who has experienced it, improves their well-being, like objectively by evidence. Um, and so the efforts that we know that school staff are engaging in trying to stop bullying, it can feel really frustrating when it doesn't stop right away or if it doesn't stop over time even. Um, and certainly that's not to say that that's acceptable that it continues. But it offered me a bit of solace to know that some of the harm of bullying is reduced when those students see someone trying to make it better. So whenever we each of us take that initiative and try, students' harm is reduced, so. Christina, I'd like you to think about one last thing you'd like to leave our audience with and our listening audience with one final message that you think would be crucial from the message you are putting forth today. So the big message that I had when I was writing this and thinking about what I might offer today, um, both on behalf of you know, myself and my many hats, um, but our entire school community, is simply that things are good. You know, Schools are good places. They deserve the care, attention, love that we're pouring into them, and more. They deserve the voices of everyone here, everyone out in our community that a public institution is public because it belongs to all of us. And when we all contribute to it, it gets better. It's better than it used to be, and the future will be better too. Public education is doing well, even, in the, even though there are areas that we need to continue to work on. There's lots that's going well. Students are learning. They're doing great things. If you meet a kid today, holy man, they are awesome. <laughs> The kids are okay, is the message. <laughs>